Hi, this is Steve Smith, and welcome to this Pluralsight video on one of the software fundamentals, the open-close principle, which represents the O in the solid. The outline for this module will include a definition of the open-close principle. We'll look at the problem that the uh, principle represents and solves. We'll see an example of what happens when one does not follow the open-close principle. And then we'll examine what's wrong with that example. And finally, we'll refactor in order to apply the open-close principle to that example. Finally, we'll have a quick summary and we'll look at some related fundamentals. The open close principle states that software entities such as classes, modules, functions, etc. should be open for extension, but closed for modification. This specific example is from Wikipedia. This slide demonstrates how the open close principle can apply in a graphic notation. It says here below, open chest surgery is not needed when putting on a coat. Likewise, when you extend your software, you should not need to go and dig around in its internals just to change its behavior. You should be able to extend it by adding to it in a, with new functionality and new classes, new functions, without the need to change your existing classes and functions while still achieving new behavior. So the open close principle offers up this sort of conundrum in that it's stating that things should be open to extension. New behavior, changes to behavior can be done in the future, but yet closed to modification. What does that mean? That means you shouldn't need to change the source code or the binary code. You shouldn't have to recompile the existing pieces of your application uh, necessarily in order to achieve this. Dr. Bertrand Meyer originated the term open closed principle in his 1988 book, Object Oriented Software Construction. So how do we do this? How do we change behavior without changing code? The key is to rely on abstractions. Once we start to rely on abstractions in our code, there's no limit to the number of different ways we can implement that abstraction and thus no limit to the number of ways we can change the behavior of the code that's using these abstractions. So what do we mean by abstractions? Well, in .NET, abstractions include interfaces as well as abstract base classes. In procedural code, we can also achieve some level of op the open closed principle using parameters. Let's look at an example of some code that's been written in such a way that it is not closed to modification, nor is it open to extension without having to hack at the actual source code. Let's look at this example here where we have a commerce solution that includes a cart, for instance, for a shopping cart. The shopping cart has a list of items. Each item is of type order item. If we look at order item, we'll see that it simply represents an item that one might place in the cart, which has a quantity and a stock keeping unit um, or SKU uh, associated with it. The cart has this important method called total amount that is used to determine what the total price of all the items in the cart should be. And because this is a pricing calculator example, you can imagine that there are different types of rules that determine how various order items within that cart are totaled up to reach their, their final total amount that the cart represents. In order to make this easy for a demo, we've simply stated that the SKU is what determines the rule. And so if the SKU starts with the word each, then that item is going to be exactly uh, $5 times the quantity. So we see the rule is simply order item quantity times five. However, if it is rather the weight, then we're going to take the price as a uh, unit price per kilogram. And so we'll take the, the order item quantity, which we've decided for some reason is in grams, and we're gonna say that it's four, um, $4 per kilogram. Finally, we have this concept of special as a, a third rule for the SKU. Special items only cost 40 cents a piece. However, they are three for a dollar. So what that means is if you buy one, it's 40 cents. You buy two, it's 80 cents. You buy three, it's a dollar. And the way this has been implemented is to simply provide a discount 
of 20 cents for each set of three that, that comes along. Now you can imagine that these rules have been come up with by the, the business user, the owner, um, whoever it is that you know is trying to maximize the sales of this particular store. And we know at this point that there are more rules coming. So this is a valid time for us to be looking at this and thinking, how can we change this code in such a way that we don't have to go in and edit this particular method every time someone comes up with a different way to price the items that are in the cart? Now, it's important, too, before we make any changes to this sort of code, that we look at some of the tests that are applied to it. And of course, before we do any refactoring, ideally we would have tests that represent the current state of this code. And so we have over here a unit test class that we can run that will verify that this is doing what we expect. So let's go ahead and run the test. And we'll see that they all pass. And so this is telling us that the cart total should return 80 cents with two special items, two with a half a kilo weight item, two dollars with six special items, five with one each item, and zero when empty, and all of these pass. And you can, if you look through each one of these tests, you'll see that they're very straightforward. We have a cart that's uh, set up at the class level and is newed up before each test in our setup method. And then our first method simply says that our cart is zero when it's empty. So when it first starts, we haven't added anything to it, and we assert that it has a value of zero. If we add an each widget with a quantity of one, we expect it to cost a total of five. If we add some peanuts that are valued by weight with 500 grams, we expect that that's going to be four times half a kilo is two, so we end up with $2. We expect 80 cents if we buy two of the special candy bars, and that's what we get here. And we expect it to be, um, with the total of six of them, that's three for a dollar, two three for a dollar makes two dollars, so we expect to get two dollars in that case. Now, if we think about how we would add additional rules to our cart for additional items here, where, for instance, maybe uh, you know it's buy four, get one free, or something like that, now we have to add yet another else if to our, our block here in order to achieve that kind of a rule. And very quickly, this type of thing gets, that gets out of hand. And so we'd really like to apply the open-close principle at this point to make it so our cart is much more flexible and maintainable and does not need to have surgery performed on it every time someone comes up with a new pricing rule within our model. So the problem with our cart is that adding new rules requires changes to the calculation method with each new rule. Now every change that we add can introduce additional bugs and requires retesting, plus we've uh, tightly coupled our pricing logic with our cart so that anytime we want to be able to test some new pricing logic, we have to set up a cart and actually test the cart rather than just testing a pricing rule. Ideally, we want to avoid introducing changes that cause cascades through many different modules in our application. And in this case, if there were many different things that depended on how the cart's behavior worked, then each change to the pricing within that cart could potentially cause this sort of change um, throughout our application. In your own applications, uh, you're going to want to look for things that tend to be tightly coupled to many different parts of your app, and ideally you want to uh, remove those dependencies by introducing abstractions that can separate those from different areas of the application. This is uh, something that's called introducing seams within your app where you can separate different parts of your application from one another. Ideally, when we're adding to our software, if it's complying to the open-close principle, the way that we'll be introducing new behavior is through the writing of new classes. And you'll find that if you follow the open-close principle, oftentimes when you're adding additional behavior or changing the way your software works, you'll be doing so by adding multiple new classes. And as a consequence, you'll typically have smaller classes each one is doing a, a very tightly focused job and following the single responsibility principle as well. The benefit of adding new classes in terms of how easy that code is to write and to design and to test is that by definition, nothing depends on these new classes yet. They didn't exist previously in your application, so none of the code that's already there knows about these classes and can have some dependency on it that you'll be breaking 
perhaps inadvertently, when you change that code. Also, new classes don't have any of the baggage that your existing app may already have in terms of dependencies on infrastructure or other hard to test classes. So you'll be able to start fresh with this new class and make something that's very straightforward, simple, easy to design, and hopefully easy for you to test. Now, there are typically three approaches to achieving the open close principle that I've found in my experience. The first one is really more of something that you would be able to do in a procedural programming language, and that is to use parameters. And so by exposing parameters in your application or in your class or in your function, you allow the client to control behavior via the specifics of that parameter. Now, this typically involves sending some kind of state to a function or to a class. For instance, a string that has some information in it, and based on that information, your class will behave a certain way. But realize, too, that you can combine this approach with delegates and lambda expressions so that it can be very powerful at actually changing exactly how the class or the function behaves and what it actually does. An example of how you can use parameters to achieve the open-close principle that I like to tell is imagine that you have a digital camera and you've written a C-sharp program that pulls all the files off of your digital camera and drops them into a folder on your C drive. You've decided, or I've decided, since my name is Steve, that I'm going to put all these files into a folder called Steve's Pictures. And I decided to just hard code that into my C-sharp program. Now, this program works so well that I decided to post it up on my blog and a whole lot of people start to use it, but I soon start getting complaints that the pictures all end up in a folder called Steve's Pictures and not in some folder that they might prefer them to be in, especially those people out there that aren't named Steve. Now, the easiest way for me to change my software and allow it to go to whatever folder the user wants to specify is to introduce a command line parameter where they could specify the output folder for this program. If I don't do that, then the only people that will be able to use my software in a way that they would like to use are developers who are going to have to open up that code, change the uh, string where I set the folder name, rebuild my application, and then run their application such that it goes to whatever folder they've set. Now, if they're smart, they'll introduce a parameter. But if they don't, and they, you know, there's a guy named Bob that wants to have his pictures and Bob's pictures, he could, in fact, just go in, change that one line in my C-sharp file, rebuild it, and now he's got a perfectly usable program that always drops the pictures into Bob's pictures, and he's happy. However, the fact that he had to change the source code means that that was not, uh, in fact, following the open-close principle. Now, the second way that we typically want to approach the open-close principle in an object-oriented programming language is to use inheritance and specifically a pattern called the template method pattern. And we'll talk more about the template method pattern in other videos, but suffice to say that this is a pattern by which you can create the default behavior in a root class. Oftentimes, you'll create a series of steps that need to be followed in a particular order. And then within your child types, you can override what each one of these steps might do um, by overriding that template method. The third approach, which is the one that we're going to look at now, involves composition in addition to inheritance, and it uses a design pattern called the strategy pattern. With the strategy pattern, the client code, the code that's calling um, the behavior, depends on an abstraction. And this provides a sort of plug-in model where the actual work that's being done is defined in a class that gets injected into the actual uh, class doing the work. So with this particular approach, we have the implementation utilizing inheritance because it inherits from in a, a base class or an interface. And then the client utilizes composition because rather than using inheritance itself to achieve this new behavior, it exposes a way for other classes to pass into it an implementation, which it then sets on a field in its class. So now let's look at how we can refactor our pricing calculator in that shopping cart so that it has a better design and maybe conforms to the open-close principle a little bit better. Let's have a look at how we can refactor our shopping cart so that it takes advantage of the open-close principle. 
The first thing we need to do is identify the fact that there's some other job that this card is doing, and that job is pricing calculation. So we need to define an interface that defines what is that pricing calculation, you know, what does it need to do and how should it behave? So what I've done is I've created an iPricing calculator interface that simply is able to calculate the price for a given order item. With this in place, now we can go back to our cart, look at its total amount, and see that when we loop through each order item and we sum up the total, all we need to do is take our pricing calculator and add the calculate price to it such that we are summing up each of these rules. This replaces the logic we had before where each if basically represented a different rule. So we had an each rule, we had a wait rule, we had a special rule. And of course there's more rules coming. So the pricing calculator has a very simple interface, which we implement in the pricing calculator.cs. And here is where we're going to new up a list of pricing rules and how they get evaluated. So when we call calculate price, all it's going to do is run through each rule, see whether or not it matches. And so this Lambda expression says, find me the first pricing rule where there is a match with the current item and call its calculate price method. So what is is match and what are these pricing rules? Well, here again, we had to introduce an interface. And in this case, that interface is I price rule. There were two pieces of each one of those rules in our original cart. The first one was, how do we know whether or not this particular rule applies? And that was determined by the logic within the if statement. The second rule was the actual use of the amount and the equation that was used in order to determine the unit price or the total price for a given quantity of units given that rule. So if we look at the price rule, we've abstracted out those two things into two separate fields. One is a Boolean that determines whether or not this price rule matches a particular order item, and the other one calculates the price. Now you could also achieve the same sort of uh, behavior by just using calculate price if you had some magic behavior that said that you know if the rule doesn't apply, we're just going to return zero or negative one or something for calculate price. Personally, I prefer to be more explicit about this and make it very clear that this rule applies or does not apply to a given uh, order item. Now that we have our abstractions in place and we have a pricing calculator that goes through our list of rules and uh, applies each one's price, we need to actually implement each one of these rules. So the easiest one to do is the each price rule. And if we look at this particular rule, we see that the is match simply takes the exact expression that we had inside of our if statement and returns it. So we're going to return item.skew starts with each. And then we're going to call calculate price. And here now we're going to return simply the body of the if statement. So item.quantity times five. If we look at the per gram price rule, you can see that it's very similar. The body of the if expression is the is match and the, uh, the contents of the if when it is true represents the calculate price. And finally, the special price, three for a dollar, um, is identical. We've pulled out the, the data that was inside of our if statement and we've applied it here. So let's make sure our tests still pass. We'll come down here and we'll change which one of our carts we're going to use to use the refactored cart. And I think that's going to have to be model.refactored cart. There we go. And we'll make this the same. Model refactored cart. All right. So now we are using the cart here that we just changed. We'll run all of our tests again. And you can see they all pass once more. So what if we wanted to add a different rule? We mentioned that perhaps there's a test method that we want to see where we have a pricing rule that says that if you buy four, you get the fifth one free. Now, just for argument's sake, let's say that each one of these items cost a unit of one. So we'll say that the cart total should return four dollars with four uh, buy four get one free items and so we're gonna say cart 
dot add new order item. We set our quantity is four. And our SKU, we haven't defined what SKU this is going to be yet. So we're going to say buy four, get one. We'll say B4, get one instead of BOGO. Um, and what should these be? We'll say these are apples. All right. Once we've done that, we're going to assert that this, in fact, returns back $4. And this will be our cart dot total amount. And we're going to run our tests. And our test fails. Because, of course, we don't have a rule that matches this yet. So how would we go about introducing a new rule that matches buy four, get one, and gives us back four uh, regularly, but otherwise is going to give us the value that we want so that when we buy the fifth one, it also costs four. Well, the first thing we need to do is create a new price rule. So we can come to our price rule and create a derive type. And this price rule is going to be called uh, buy four, get one free price rule. And of course, we're going to want this to be public. And we're going to need to implement these things. So this will be a match return item dot skew dot starts with b4 get one and that looks pretty much like our each price rule right yep and on that same note let's go ahead and pull out the each where we said times one and in the spirit of test-driven development, we're going to just do the simplest thing that could possibly work, which I think I've done now to get that test to pass. So when I run this, oh, I need to actually add this rule. So we need to buy four, get one free. We need to add this to our pricing calculator. So pricing rules dot add new that build. All right, run our tests and look, it works. So, of course, we haven't actually tested that it does what it should do when there's five items. And so that'll be our next step, where we'll say $4 with four by four, get one free items. Well, we think it should be $4 with actually five of those items as well. So if we change this quantity to five, everything else should still work. Actually, it should fail because we haven't implemented our rule yet. And we get $4 with five by four items failed. It actually was $5 that it returned. So we need to go back to our rule. And while we're here, let's go ahead and move this to another t uh, file. And this buy four, get one rule. It's great that we want to do that, but it turns out this rule is actually very similar to the three for a dollar rule. So if we go pull out that, we'll just snag that code real quick and jump in and drop it in here. And what it turns out is that we can just take the total quantity times one, the sets of, in this case, uh, five, equals item quantity divided by five. And at any time we actually get that, we wanna just take the sets of five minus one, and that will achieve our, our rule. So it's basically buy four, get one free is the same as saying that you get a dollar off every time you buy five, where a dollar happens to also be the cost of each unit. So we'll build this and we'll run our tests one more time. And you can see that they all pass. Now, in this case, the way that we achieved this, um, we didn't have to touch the cart. Our implementation of total amount remained unchanged. Our pricing calculator, we added one item here in its constructor where we're setting up these rules, but you could imagine that these rules could easily be uh, passed in through some kind of configuration or database such that we wouldn't have to touch the pricing calculator itself. The logic of the pricing calculator, this calculate price method, remained unchanged. So the only real new code that we had to write in our buy four, get one free rule was in this new class that did not previously exist where we implemented its interface using this code here.
So when do we apply the open close principle? It's important not to just willy-nilly try and add abstractions everywhere within your code, because the result is going to be something that's very difficult for anyone to follow and it'd be more complex than needed. The first thing that you should think about is what does your experience with this particular type of problem tell you? If you know from your own experience in the problem domain that a particular class of change is likely to happen, you can apply OCP up front in your design. However, if you don't know this, and oftentimes if you're working on in new problem domains, you're not going to know, you should follow the fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me practice, where at first you should just code up the simplest thing that could possibly work. Hard code the values if you need to, put the logic inside of an if-then statement, do something that's simple and works, and make sure you test it. If the module changes once, do the simplest thing that can make it work. Add an else statement to your if statement, if that's all it takes, and continue on, making sure again that you've got tests that demonstrate the behavior. However, once it changes a second time, now you're at the point where you know this is something that's volatile. It's, it's shown that it has a propensity for frequent change. It's time to refactor it to achieve the open-close principle. And the way you do that is by finding an abstraction, creating an interface, and then extracting out the if-then logic or switch statement logic into separate classes where each one represents a particular node in that decision tree. Remember tan staffle. There ain't no such thing as a free lunch. Implementing the open-close principle will add complexity to your design, and you cannot have a design that is closed against all changes. So you want to make sure that you choose those types of changes that are actually likely to occur for your design to be closed against. Otherwise, you'll have added complexity with no benefit. So to summarize, if you write your software such that it conforms to the open-close principle, it will yield flexibility, reusability, and maintainability in your application. You want to try and know which changes to guard against, and of course resist premature abstraction. There are some related fundamentals to this, the single responsibility principle, which is also part of solid, as well as a couple of design patterns, the strategy pattern, which we saw utilized here and which is explained further in other videos, and the template method pattern, which I mentioned, um, but which you'll have to go watch another video in order to see how it's applied. As recommended reading, I highly recommend the book Agile Principles, Patterns and Practices in C Sharp by Robert C. Martin and Micah Martin. And to wrap up, I'd like to include some credits for the uh, motivational poster on the open close principle that we saw in this presentation. And I'd like to thank you very much for your time, and I hope that you'll continue to learn from us through additional Pluralsight on-demand videos.